Hello, I'm Rory McKiernan, author of Hitching for Hope, and you're very welcome to the Love and Courage podcast. A heartfelt thanks to all you patrons who continue to chip in and support and promote the podcast in whatever way you can. My guest in this episode is Anne Rin. Anne is a singer, songwriter and community stalwart living in Milltown Malbay, not too far away from me here in County Clare on the wild west coast of Ireland. Anne took up the guitar in her 60s and since then has created and released two albums. It might be no surprise that music was a calling for Anne given her family background. She grew up in County Kildare in the same household as two famous Irish folk musicians, Luca Bloom and Christy Moore. Anne is hugely respected in her community as being a real force for love and courage. This episode was originally created for my other podcast, The Creative Souls of Clare podcast, and it got a great response, so I thought I would share it here for you, Love and Courage podcast listeners, and I hope you enjoy it. It was recorded over Zoom during one of the lockdown periods, so the video version is also available if you look up Anne Rin, Creative Souls of Clare on Facebook or on YouTube, you can find the video there. I know you're going to enjoy the episode, so please do consider sharing it where you can, as well as subscribing if you're new to the Love and Courage podcast and leaving ratings, reviews, all that kind of thing on your favourite podcast app. It helps the podcast grow and get inspirational and wise voices like Anne's out into the world. Now, let's get started with this conversation with Anne Rin. Anne Rin, how is life for you in Milltown Malby? Just very, very good at the moment, uh, Rory. In yeah, we're we're all well, which is most important. We're all being as patient as we can be, and we're just getting on with it. Good on you. What more can we do? Good on you. Well, thanks for joining me. It's great. I I really uh, think of you as somebody that's oozing creativity. You know that. Um, it's fair to say that like, you, you've definitely had a, a rich few years of it. And, you know, two albums in how long? It was a short yeah, enough period. I picked up the guitar eight years ago. Yeah. Unbelievable. It's, I mean, I mean to, to hear you saying that is kind of, what? It's amazing. Yeah. Eight years ago. So you were what? 24. I was, I was 64. 64. Yeah. Well, I'm 64. Lovely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, and it's, then from picking up the guitar to creating the first album, what was the time? That was yeah. 60, uh, that was, uh, uh, and I, I launched it in 2016, my first album, on my, on my birthday, actually. And was that was that like a lifelong dream, or what was the kind of impulse? Did it, did it just take its own course and journey and unfold before you? Yeah, it it, it it wasn't a life stream. I always knew I could sing, but I was I, I come from a musical family, as you are aware. Um, I uh, m- my mother and father were both fabulous singers, and there they are, right behind me, on my shoulder. Oh, that's lovely. And, yeah, and so so obviously I am aware of your musical family, but not everyone maybe watching or okay. listening would be. So maybe you might want to. to I'd be absolutely delighted to. Behind me are my parents, Andy Moore and Nancy Power. And they're the ones that gave us all the, 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 the beautiful gift of music. And uh, my brothers have gone on to uh, do queer things around music and become just a little known, like around the country. Christy Moore, you might have heard of him, uh, being the eldest of the family. And then the other bookend is Barry, our darling brother, Barry, uh, who is also known as Luca Bloom. And, uh, and my other uh, family, my sisters are Eilish and Terry, both good singers, and my brother down in Cork, Andy, is also a terrific singer. Wow! Yeah, and it's uh, time to get the band back together. I think it's. Uh, yeah, wouldn't it be cool? I, I, I mean, I'd, I'd love it, but I, I don't know at this stage now would it ever happen. But you, nothing yeah. else dreaming. Nothing well, else dreaming. yeah, if not in this world, maybe in the yeah in the other world. Who yeah. knows? Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. And can you talk to me a little bit about your parents, Anne, and what the what influences they had on you, particularly musically? Well, my father died when we were all very young. I mean, Christy was 11 and I was eight and Barry was a year old. So we have very, he was only 41 when he died very tragically uh, and very suddenly. And uh, my my memories of him would be very few, very few. One thing I do remember, I, I've, I've actually got two very vivid memories of him. One is of him, he was a big man, big broad-shouldered man, walking up the, the town with his newspaper under his oxter, 
whistling. And I could hear him from the house. I could go, oh, daddy's coming, daddy's coming. And then going out to visit uh, Granny Moore out in Milltown, uh, he'd be singing, what was the song he sang? Uh, I've got a lovely bunch of coconuts. And I remember that. I was, I was only maybe five or six at the time, you know. And that's really all the memories I have of him. But Nancy was an amazing singer, beautiful singer. She won medals all over the place. She won the Fesh Kjol in, um, she won a gold medal in the Fesh Kjol. I, I can't remember the year now, but uh, back along, as they say. And uh, she sang, uh, she sang in all the musicals in Newbridge. And she's a beautiful, beautiful voice. She sang in the choir in the Dominican uh, College. And she, uh, she was an amazing woman, very strong woman to be left with six children. So young, and um, she, ra- she 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 raised us all. She worked, had to work very very hard, and uh, but there was always music in the house. Of, of, of a Saturday evening, like she'd sit at the piano, and neighbours would come in, and we'd all be there, and we'd be singing away. And she was a remarkable, woman, remarkable. I, miss, I actually have her here right beside me as well. Ah, oh, that's lovely. That's one of the last photographs that was taken over with Mary Robinson. I'll just hold that up closer to the camera there, Anne, for, for those that are watching this. Yeah. Oh, that's lovely. Photo of Nancy and Mary Robinson, former president of Ireland. That's amazing. That was uh, two months before she died. It was our last day out together. We were invited up to lunch at Oris and Uthron by our president, our beloved president. And it was such, oh my God, I'm really crying thinking about it. It was such a beautiful, beautiful day. Fantastic, and yeah. and so that mu- music was in the air and and in the in the house and in the bones in a sense. But yeah. where then did it go for you from there? Like, did is that something that you took on throughout school and and after school? Not or, really. or no, uh, for starters, I I hated school, <laughs> absolutely hated it. Uh, I I got married very young. I got married. I met Dava Grin when I was sixteen, and I got married to him at nineteen, and we proceeded to have five children. And we lived in Prosperous in County Kildare, uh, in Downing's house where Christie's m- m- terrific album at the beginning of the, uh, Planksy, uh, the, the album was made in the, the basement in Downing's house. What a week that was, man. Oh, that was that was something else. That was there was some learning in that. Marvellous. It was a marvellous week. And then we did, we decided because Davik is uh, also a musician. He plays the whistle and we decided through circumstances, uh, to move from Kildare down to Clare. And that's 43 years ago on the 16th of December, next month. Never for one second did we regret it. We love it. Absolutely love living here. So, so like, I'm kind of curious as well that, like, a lot of the... Uh, a lot of people I meet in County Clare aren't originally from County Clare, but... The, that's not necessarily ever emphasized. You know, it feels like a county that has strong roots and strong identity, but yet seems to be very welcoming and embracive, embracing yeah. of, of people yeah. from all over. Very much so. I think, I think when we moved here in 77, we, we might have been sort of the first of a, 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 a bunch of people that began to move into Clare, and it was a, a little bit challenging. The first sort of six months, on t- but the fact that we had five children made people realise they must be serious about what they're doing. They wouldn't be doing this if they weren't with five children, you know. And uh, we we were we were t- taken in, in. We integrated fairly fairly quickly into the uh, into the community, and uh, we're just very blessed, very blessed to live where we live. And that that integration, you know, it 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 makes me think of. Um, you know, the depth of community spirit in Clare. And I know that that's been a big part of your life that oh yeah, you could yeah. say like, you know, community uh, supporting each other, but also community activism or community actions being part of your life as well. Is, oh, gosh, yeah. That's that's another influence of Nancy. Definitely. Both my parents actually, because uh, daddy was a politician. Uh, he was actually chair of uh, Kildare County Council when he died. But um, that's going back again. But uh, yeah, all all our lives we we have been taught. We were taught by by our parents the, that it, to be to, to be supportive of people and uh, justice for people and to make sure that uh, things were done right. And um, I've always been very interested in 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 the whole concept of community development. So much so that when our when our youngest uh, went to left home and went to college, his old ma went to college as well. 
I went up to Maynooth and did a course in community development. And uh, yeah, and worked for worked down in Kiki and Kilrush down in South Clare for a number of years. Um, and loved it, absolutely loved it. Yeah. And what was that like, uh, you know, going to college at that time? Did you, was that, a you know, evenings, weekends? How did that work out? Well, I actually, I actually went up and lived with my sister. My sister, Terry, lives in Newbridge and I stayed with her and I, and I, 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 I managed to organise a lift out to minutes from an, another student every day and we, we got on really well and that, that worked very well. So I'd go up to, uh, on a Monday morning and uh, come home at the weekend and to look after Davok and Domica and get back up there again. Rory, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. It was just going, it was just like going into a different world. It was fabulous. Such an honour to be able to do it. Yeah. And what about then, the, what what came next in Kilkee? And t- talk to me a little bit about that. Well, I did my final exam on a Friday and I did an interview on Monday for a job in Kilkee with Irie Kirkoboshkin and I got the job. And uh, I'm blown away, completely blown away. I mean, I had spent 26 years at home looking after, look, looking after the family. And this was such a whole new thing for me. After two years in Maynooth and then then to go to, to walk into a job like that, it was fantastic. And I, and I loved it. I did a lot of work around women, uh, setting up women's groups in the area. I worked with, um, I worked with uh, around childcare. Uh, we 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 organised. Um, I actually did another course down in in Cork around social uh, the social economy. I did a, a diploma around that, and we came back to West, to South Clare and uh, set up early early um, childcare early years. I can't remember the name of it now; it's so long ago. But anyway, um, work like that and working with people with disabilities, I have a fair idea of the the the, the way of dis- of disability in 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 Ireland because uh, one of our boys is uh, a disabled man, um, and uh, he's he's been a fighter. He is he's uh, he is uh, his name is Donica Donica Rin. He turned fifty uh, in June. Oh my God! I mean that, that's just amazing to me. And he's uh, he he has fought all his life for his rights and for the rights of people with disabilities. He he was one of the founders of the Disabled People of Clare, and worked with Dermot. Uh, the, the, I'm sure you know the comrade uh, Dermot Hayes, and uh, uh, worked with. Oh uh, yeah, he he he. Um, I don't know where I'm going with this now, but but he's he's a, he's a remark. He's actually the inspiration of our lives, Donald. If you don't mind me talking about him for a few. Not minutes. at all. In fact, yeah. you know, th- this uh, podcast is Creative Souls of Clare, and he's he is a creative soul of Clare, isn't he? He sure is. I just tell you a little bit about him, Donald. When he was born, he was a twin. He was the second twin. His twin is his twin is Niall. And Donald uh, suffered very mild brain damage at birth, so he had he had a very mild form of cerebral palsy. And all his young life, he wanted to um, just be a normal guy. He wanted to be like Niall. And he really fought hard. He, he, and I, I kind of think he fought too hard. He, um, <clears throat> when he was 19, he started to fall. And for five years, they couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. And eventually, the, the diagnosis came in uh, that he had um, MS, multiple sclerosis. And ever since then, he has, uh, he has struggled with his life. He has struggled since then. Very, uh, he's had a very difficult life, and currently, like that, he is still alive is remarkable. We have the most amazing team of people who look after him. Our lo- our local GP, Doctor Billy, is just they're just the dream team, I call them. And Donald is in there inspiring us all. He doesn't communicate a lot these days. He's very fragile, very very vulnerable, and uh, but he's still there. He's still smiling and. Uh, yeah, ask him how are you today? I'm not calling him grand ma, how are you? <laughs> yeah, he's 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 the mystical man. That's what he is, Ardons. Can you talk to me about Donica's book? I sure can. So Barry, my brother Barry, um visit every time we went in to visit Donica, he'd come out and he'd say, That fella has a book in him. What how are we going to do it? Because at, at this stage Donica couldn't write anymore because his because of the MS. And so we decided we had a big, 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 long chat about it, and we we asked a great friend of Donica's, uh, Tom Prendergast, would he be interested in coming into Donica maybe once a week with a recorder and recording him, 
and Tom jumped at it. He absolutely loved the idea because he loves Donica. And for two years, once a week, Tom came into Donica. And I'd say it was a very difficult job because Donica's memory was beginning to go. And uh, but Tom stuck with it. And the result of that uh, that project was being Donica, Donica's book. And uh, the, first, the front of the book is um, being Donica. It's Donica's words recorded. And then the middle of the book is Donica's uh, poetry, which he wrote when he was a teenager. And at, at the back of the book, then it's knowing Donica. So the family all chipped in and, and wrote words about him and stuff. And it's an absolutely delightful book. It's 10 years out now and it's still as fresh as a daisy. It still resonates with people because Donica's, it's Donica's truth. That's what I call it. It's Donica's truth. Um, he he's he's just a, a really special guy. Very, what I say about Dunlop is he was born old. You know that kind of a person, yeah. an old, an old wise head on him, and a great sense of what life is about. I have never, in the fifty years I know this man since he was born, I have never heard him complaining. I have never heard him saying why me or being angry or just giving out about why he got the he he got this this life. Never. He's very, very grateful for the life he has. He's remarkable. And, you know, even though people don't see him, his spirit is all over the place. He's, he's around. So people, people can feel Donica in town. People, people locally here would always ask, how is he? How is he doing? Isn't he amazing? And they're aware of him. And, and some, those who believe pray for him. And it's just lovely. It's well, lovely the, the the impression he has had on 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 our world. It just it just occurs to me now that the the beautiful tribute you you've been paying to him there that you know it it he he's now going to be heard about from from people all over Clare, but all all over Ireland and in fact all over the world. You know, so yeah, his yeah. Uh, spirit is rippling out there. Fantastic. That's so. That's I'm so precious. I could, I could talk about him all day. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen. Before we move back on to you, Anne, there we might as well talk about the other fella as well. That uh, in your household, that um, probably my sense is that he'd be a little bit shy himself of of talking about you know. Well, but the, the dad man. Yeah, but you are a creative powerhouse, and you're you know as individually, but collectively, but. Could you just tell people a little bit about um, your your wonderful husband as well? Davok is his name, uh, and he's Davok is now eighty one, and uh, he's retired. He 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 was an, all of all of his life. Davok was always fascinated with old furniture, and uh, uh, he, when I met him, he was a farmer with one cow, and he always had the excuse, "I have to go home and milk the cow." <laughs> 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 but anyway, he, he he got really into the antiques. He started going to auctions. This is way this is way back in the sixties now, and he became quite a successful antique dealer. And he specialised in country furniture, country folklore, folk life, that kind of thing. And uh, he loved it. He 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 really loved it. And he's he, he's he, he's quite an expert on it. He 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 would know the different styles from the different parts of the country, like there. Dressers made in Cork are totally d- different to dress- dressers made in Donegal, that kind of thing. Amazing. So he worked at that all of his life. and But but alongside that, he played the whistle. Now, for, for about 10 or 15 years when we were busy rearing the family, there was no music going on in the house. But then then he started playing again, and uh, he's he has become quite a, a whistle player, fabulous whistle player. So when he started to retire, he decided he'd have to do something about the whistle playing. So what does he do? He gets a permit to go up and uh, busk up at the cliffs of Moher. And I swear to God, it's been the making of him. He loves it. He absolutely loves it. And he goes up. Well, he, he's not doing it at the moment, obviously. But um, he really loves it. He loves seeing the people coming in and dancing around him and having the crack. And he's a lovely, lovely whistle player. He loves nothing more than to go and join Owen O'Neill at his sessions and play play with Owen. And, and she, sure, I mean, Claire and the traditional music of uh, Rory, just remarkable. Um, we, 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 we desperately miss uh, the sessions, but we'll get back to it. We'll get back to it. 
Yeah, and you're you're living in you know quite the national hotspot in in Milltown for Willie Clancy. Absolutely, and all yeah. All the surrounding. For sure, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. so th- that's been obviously a large part of your life as well. Just that. Oh, gosh, yeah. I mean, the Willie Clancy uh, Summer School has been a, a, a lifesaver for Milton Malbay, uh, thanks to the wonderful Willie Clancy. What a marvelous man he was. Um, I actually used to run a thing called the People's Kitchen during uh, for about twelve years. I did it during the uh, the, the summer school, and I absolutely loved it. It was the best of fun. Like we'd be making five hundred meals a day. The hardest work I ever did. Oh my God. But it was all vegetarian before it was cool to be a vegetarian and all vegetarian, all freshly prepared. And I used to hate the thought of it. I'd start preparing for it around May, March. And by the time it came around in July, once the first cup of tea was made, I was off. And the buzz for 10 days was just huge. I loved it. It was great. Oh, that sounds um, amazing. It was. It really and, was. And, yeah. and just before we f- finish up talking about Davog, the, 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 can you tell, tell people a little bit about his book as well? Oh, God, you're, you're a great man to remember things. <laughs> <laughs> so for, for uh, uh, alongside playing The Whistle and uh, the Antique Dealing and that, all, all his life Davog has written, just written down things anywhere and everywhere. And I kept saying to him, I've been reading his notes and his stories and I said, Dav, you really should work on getting that together. So himself and myself and a dear friend of ours, Trish Flanagan, got it together. And uh, we um, he published the book a year ago. Is it a year ago now or two years ago? No, I think it was last year, October last year, we published it alongside my my second album. It's called Strike a Light. And it's a, a, it's just a book of, of stories and uh, some fiction and some, some about family, some me- memories. And he has a lovely, he's a kind of a unique way of writing. He's Because when you, when you read Davok's stories, you can actually hear his voice in them. And it's just lovely. I, I'd be slightly biased, but... Uh, Are there any chance of knocking an audio book out of him? Um, there's a thought. There's something. We'll, yeah. we'll, <laughs> we'll talk about that again, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, so so let's go back to your music, Anne. And, yeah. um, you know, what was that journey like picking up the guitar and where did it start and how did it start? Okay, so Barry, my brother, my my fabulous brother Barry moved to Clare about, I'd say about nine years ago now. And one day, he's, he lives up uh, in this corner and he, one one day he was down, we were sitting around the table drinking a cup of tea. He said, Anne, why are you not singing? And I spoke Barry on, and I, always, I used to always get flustered if I thought somebody was going to ask me to sing. I was a bit of an old nervous Nelly Rory, which is ridiculous. So he, I, I said that to him. I said, Barry, I, I get very nervous if people ask me to sing. And he says, you know, when you're singing a song on, you're delivering a message. And all you've got to do is just take it, remove yourself from it and just, just deliver the message. And it was kind of like, what? Why did I never think of that? Mm. Never occurred to me. So that kind of started it. And then my son in Davog, who lives in France, who is also a musician and an artist, uh, sent me a message one day. He says, man, learn a few songs, come on over and, and sing at this festival with me. And I said, oh, what? OK. So I did. And then about a month after Barry and I had that conversation, he came into the house one day carrying a guitar and he handed it to me. And these are the exact words. He says, I am not giving you this guitar. I'm loaning it to you for 50 years on condition that you play it every day. He didn't, wow. have, he didn't have to say it twice. Oh, my God. I just grasped it with both hands. And but I love it. I absolutely love it. I, I it was right. The first year was, was tough now learning it. My poor fingers. But um, I just love it. I took to it like a duck to water. And uh, then one day he said to me, uh, come on up and sing a few songs that you've learned and we'll have a listen. And then he said to me, I think you could record some of those songs. And I said, what? You're mad. Wow. So we did. So, and. Oh, wow. Yeah. Here she is. So that's the first album you're showing me there. Fantastic. That's the first album, yeah. And it's an album of covers at the time. I wasn't writing any songs. And... Um, just amazing. What a buzz. Lordy Gordy. <laughs> and did we, did, were you aware that, that that was like an active kind of mentoring? It certainly sounds like mentoring. 
Oh, I would consider Barry my mentor completely, yeah, uh, yeah definitely. Um, well, what he said to me, he said, I always knew you could sing, and I always knew you were a really good singer, and I always knew that you could do harmonies, and you're just full of music, and I just wondered why you never did anything with it. Mm. So he gave me the, yeah. he just gave me the little push that I needed. Yeah, it's it's a great question for anyone, isn't it? You know, why did you not do anything with that thing that you have? And I suppose yeah, and I would people, have, yeah. People, sorry for cutting across you. People would say to me, like, you must have been dreaming about this all your life. Yeah. I was too busy to be thinking about things like that, you know. But yeah. I'm totally grateful at this, this stage in my life to have it. But is that, does that speak to the idea that you were, you know, it's not you exclusively, this is, people but i would say perhaps also disproportionately women of a of a generation as well that maybe didn't have the luxury of having those dreams absolutely absolutely or didn't have the time to even <laughs> stand still to have a dream to even think about having a dream yeah because i suppose if you work as i did for 26 years you kind of uh, you as a person kind of you disappear you melt into the family and you kind of disappear i disappeared for 26 years and I don't mean that in any derogatory way of, of you with regards to my family. That was just what happened. And uh, there, was a lot, there was a lot of learning in it. But uh, we learn every day. We learn every day. And just my life in the last eight years has just been remarkable. Mm. Never imagined it for a sec. I mean, I did the Late Late Show. Rory. The <laughs> I nearly died of fright, mind you. But <laughs> so, so that's that's obviously the biggest TV show in Ireland. And what was that like? You know, just that the days up running up to that, and what was going through your mind? It was absolutely terrifying. I was, um, but I, but 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 the reason I was doing it uh, was because I'd written a song about homeless children, and I just decided that I am doing this. I am absolutely doing this because in all of the talk around the homeless uh, crisis that's on in Ireland still. Uh, all the talk of the three or four thousand children, God between us and all harm, when I think of it, that are homeless. Uh, you never heard a child's voice, and I just wanted to, um, I just wanted to remind people about that. So I wrote a song called "Mammy, When Are We Going Home?" And uh, the late late show asked me would I come up and sing it on the show, and I said, "This is not about me. It's not about entertainment. It's not about." Ryan Tuberty or or any but anything else. This is about homeless children, and I kept my focus on that. Um, that that got me through it. Yeah, it uh, delivered a message. Yeah, exactly. Deliver the message. Yeah. Yeah, and and that that reminds me of the power of uh, of music as a form of um, I suppose you could say agitation, mobilization you know, Absolutely. campaigning, like folk music in particular has traditionally had that important role. Yeah, most definitely. Most definitely. In fact, I, I tell you a little story. Uh, that the, the, the day I launched my album at the Doolan Folk Festival, my first album at the Doolan Folk Festival, uh, Bernadette Devlin was in the audience. And you would be familiar with Bernadette Devlin, I'm sure, Bernadette Michalski. I, I would, but, but just for anyone that isn't, maybe just give a very yeah. quick reference to... Bernadette was one of the leaders of the civil rights movement in the North uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, and complete and absolute shero of mine, a heroine of mine, I just marvellous, marvellous woman. And Barry said to me before I went out on stage, he says, you know, Bernadette Devlin's in the audience. I said, oh my God. <laughs> so Whoa. so uh, afterwards, I, I was t- talking to people about her. I said, oh my God, I'm so, I was just so thrilled to, to meet her. And uh, people, people, some people said to me, "Said who's she?" And I was horrified. I was just so horrified. Yeah. So one of the first songs I ever wrote was called Bernadette. Yeah. Uh, Bernadette Devlin. She was and 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 even the fact that you know she's such a seminal figure in in modern Irish history yeah. and politics and culture, and um, the fact that a huge amount of people wouldn't know of her is yeah. is intentional. You know, maybe not as an individual level, but systemically that. The, the, the system has, in a sense, tried to erase radical voices like that. Absolutely. Sure, Bernadette Devlin would have been a nightmare for the system and, yeah. and, and, and is still fighting away fair play yeah, to yeah. Fair play to her, yeah. yeah, and hence hence the power of music again to yes. remind people and, and keep memory alive. Yeah, yeah, I, I, and I'm very drawn towards songs like, like that, like Patti Smith's song, Power to the People. No, that's, I always say that wrong. It's people have the power. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
People Have the Power. I, yeah. I, yeah, I love that song. And uh, there was a song that Johnny Cash wrote, which is on my second album, uh, called um, What is Truth? And it's a song he sang to Richard, Richard Nixon in 1974. And I, I I came across it and I thought, oh my God, is that ever relevant today mm. in today's world? So um, yeah, there's some great songs, some some marvelous songs out there. And uh, I've written a song about Greta Thunberg, um, which I, I I really like, and I love I love the work that she's doing. And I'd be very I'd be I I would be my ear would be very open for for songs around around life in in, in today. Mm. Yeah, and you, you've also written. Uh, I can't remember the exact uh, words or name of the song, but I he- once heard you singing a song about the locality and the community and the, kind of the butcher, the baker type song. Oh yeah, oh, what's yeah. that one? Oh, what was that called? You sang it at My Hill Farm. I did. I and did. It was about the joy of you know going in and and picking up the bread from the baker and then going off and having the chat and. That's right. And you I have so many songs now. You can't. I can't it. <laughs> yeah, I wrote my first song. I wrote my first song about three days after I launched my first album. Oh, fantastic. And I've been writing ever since. And it's just love. It. And what does your um, what does your creative practice look like in terms of where do you do you shut yourself away in a room or take out? Where, where does it happen? And. Is it any time of the day or? Yeah, any time of the day or night. Sometimes I wouldn't be a great sleeper and sometimes I'd be awake and things would be going through my head. So normally what I would do is I'd take up the pen and I'd just start uh, just writing whatever comes, whatever's in my mind. And then before I know it, there's a, there's a, there's a line going there and oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It could be like that. And some songs come out just, just like the Mammy. The Mammy song came out just like that. I think if I feel something really deeply, it'll, it'll come out fast. Some of them you struggle with. You, yeah. you know, if I, I put away a few songs that I've, I might get back to or I might not. Yeah. But some of them are, are easy. There was one that I wrote recently uh, called um, Be Kind. I'm a devil about the kindness, about love and kindness. And uh, I think I think we all need to be to, 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 to show love and to be kind more more every day, every day. That that strikes me as almost a, uh, you know, almost Buddhist in in approach, loving kindness. Yeah, I would have, I would have really latched onto that. I I I wouldn't consider myself. I, I'm not a religious person, but I am. I suppose I'm. We all have a spirit. We all have a spirit, and I think. I, and I used to go down to uh, Dochimbera in West Cork for uh, they have a, a had a retreat called uh, Loving Kindness Retreat. I did that for about three years. And really got really benefited from it, and that's where I learned a lot about lo- uh, how how positive and how good lo- love is, and how and kindness is, and how we need to be more vocal about it. Why are people so shy about being kind and 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 showing love for people? You know, it's so important, so important, so so important. Mm. But um, yeah, be kind, be kind, be kind. Yeah. yeah, here's to that. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Easiest, easiest thing in the world to do, Rory. If you're, say you're, you, you, you have somebody in your head and you're giving out in your head about it, all you've got to use is those two words, be kind. It turns it around completely, immediately. Yeah. And changes your mood. It's, it's amazing. And and I would also uh, say that in that, the importance of being kind to yourself, isn't it? Definitely. You know, yeah. that's yeah. that's one of the harder ones. Yeah, it is. Yeah, <laughs> and you're done flogging yourself. Practice what you preach. Practice what you Put preach. away the whip from the flogging or whatever you know. I know. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a big one. So, um, and have you are you working on any projects these days or anything and anything brewing and stirring? Uh, not really at the moment. Uh, I I have I have I have great uh, women. I'm very involved with the Clare Women's Network, and uh, I was I was chair of it for a few years and. Uh, we're working on, on on racism at the moment and I'm finding that very, very interesting and I'm learning an awful lot about it. It's, what are you learning about it? Uh, that the privilege that we as white people have and it's shocking. It really is shocking. And uh, that we need to, we need to, um, we need to learn, learn. It's in our DNA, you see, because all, 
Ireland has been such a white country, uh, but that is now changing and we need to learn how to uh, integrate all the colours of the world into, into, into Ireland and to treat people. As far as I'm concerned, I see people as human beings. I, I, I honestly don't see colour. I never... The first time we started talking, the first day we started talking about this, I was I was so shocked that I was silent because I did not know how to respond. And uh, they talk about white privilege and white this and white that. I have never in my 72 years had to consider that I am white. I, I've, I've never had to think about it even. You know, it's... it's it's very strange. It's 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 very strange, and it must be very strange for all of our new citizens coming in into 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 the country. It must be very difficult for them. Very very difficult for them, and we need to we need to 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 to, to skill ourselves to to help them to integrate into our world. And what do you think it is that that creates the pushback on that? Because you know there will be some people who will say, "Well, why do I have to change? It's my country and it's my place and it's my this and that." Systemic. It's systemic. It's 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 a system. System is all wrong, Rory. The system is all wrong. The system is not about people. The system is about profit, patriarchy, money, finance, business. Oh, it drives me mad. The system drives me mad. <laughs> There's, there's a line for the song anyway. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. So so we won't get into it too much here, Anne, because it's a whole other... Um, oh, it's a whole... Oh, you need a whole day to talk about it. Well, well, I was going to talk specifically about the direct provision and stuff, but I, I w- just when you are talking about um, some of this integration and so on, you know, I, I remember... Um, fellas from different parts of the world and and a lot of uh, Muslim guys that, you know, in the last few years, there's been a lot of demonization or images painted of what a Muslim guy is and looks like and sounds like. And then when I came to meet some of them in Milltown Malby in a direct, an emergency direct provision center, th- there was such a, a gentle kindness and timidness. It was unusual. It was kind of very striking. And and then to see them very kind of isolated and lonely and it, like it's, it can be very romantic being in the West of Ireland when you know everyone and all the rest. But if you don't know a soul, it can be bleak and miserable. Awesome. Awesome. But you, you were giving lifts to the lads to the beach to bring them swimming. And like, so that was a, such a, you could say a simple act, but a powerful act. Um, yeah. Well, to me, it just felt like... The obvious thing to do here's here's they don't know the area they don't know what's going on and I just offered them a lift and then when I said it I started saying oh my god oh Jenny what am I after doing and I just did it anyway and it was one of the best things I did for for a long time it was just amazing to see the joy on their faces diving into the sea some of these people had never ever seen the sea before they'd never been at the seaside and to be out in Spanish Point diving into the waves was just Oh, it was just fabulous, you know. And it was, it was, it was just amazing to meet those 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 young men, and some of them had been through so much. Oh my God, it it, it was a very difficult time for them. Being being in, it was a, it was a wonderful time because the community really gathered around them, and we we helped them, and we 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 did we got them playing guitars, and we got them singing and dancing. We organised dancing classes for them and English classes and. And it kind of, yeah, it's, well, you know, you know yourself, the, 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 the direct provision system is such a corrupt, a, corrupt is not even the right word to use. It's just, it's just wrong. It's just wrong. It, it's, it's, it's done the wrong way. And uh, it, it, the length of time that they have to spend in direct provision is just crazy. It's, and it's, a, it's again, it's the system. The system is so wrong. Yeah. So well, it didn't end very well at Milltown. It didn't end very well at all in Milltown Malbay. It, it, the, the place was closed down for a finish, and rightly so, because it, was, it wasn't fit for purpose. Yeah, well, it was only meant to be a temporary centre anyway, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, so so I, I'm just, I'm staying with direct vision, but moving more into the, the, the role of creativity and the arts there, because... One of the things that I observed in in that um, community work around that and, and elsewhere was dance, drumming, guitar, singing, seeing lads from Libya or 
Iraq or wherever, you know, um, just, you know, playing the oud or, uh, and, and then other lads with Irish music. And then you had uh, Brian Fleming playing, Afri- who's a prolific um, West African drummer from mm-hmm. Ireland, teaching African drumming to the Africans. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Uh, but there's such a bonding through music and dance yeah. that transcends all of the shite and the Absolutely. politics. It's universal. And the, it's uni- music is universal, you know. Yeah. You, you mightn't understand the words of a song and you might be deeply moved by it and you don't know why you're deeply yeah, moved. Yeah, yeah. It's fantastic. And then I remember hearing a, an Iraqi song and, and a kind of lament, you know, and thinking such Shan sensibility to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It def- it's universal, you see. It's completely universal. And it's and I can't get over the healing qualities of music. I can't get over how calming it can. How ca- it makes you calm. It makes you feel happy. If you're, if 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 I feel down, or if I f- if I'm lacking in energy, I go and I pick up the guitar and I sing a few songs, and that's that gone. Beautiful. It's really beautiful, and it should be. It should be. Uh, uh, I mean, way the way mu- musicians and artists are being treated uh, during the current uh, uh, scenario chaos is beyond disgraceful beyond disgraceful you know uh, and that ha- that will have to be looked at that will definitely have to be looked at because music <laughs> music and arts and culture have to be to, uh, much more to the front than they are than it is at the moment than culture is at the moment it's um yeah people are really struggling yeah there, there, there's certainly like a, a a lot of people talking about the need for music and culture and arts but then to to it needs it needs uh, infrastructure and resources and support and definitely. radio play and yeah. all of these things, not just kind words, you know. Yeah, definitely. Like, I know in France, for example, because Davo, my son lives there, and they have a system in France where if you are a musician or if you are an artist, and it's it's like you're you're self employed and you're you're not working all the time because the gigs aren't on all the time. If you do a certain, for example, with him, if he does a certain number of gigs every year. He's entitled to uh, a benefit, a, a, an artist's benefit, which he gets. And that keeps the bread on the table and the, the, yeah. the bill paid. Yeah. Well, I know myself just to have the benefit of, you know, and it's I don't always have it, but the, the consistency of bread on the table can free up a lot of creativity as well. Sure. Yeah. Now they do also say hunger is a good sauce, but that's probably overly egged on and romanticized. That you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's 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 a big thing. Livelihoods, and I I think that's you know it's just important that artists are respected and valued, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And so, Anne, just um, before we finish up, I just want to uh, get your thoughts on anyone that hasn't really perhaps tapped their full creativity or, or maybe has an inkling or, you know, maybe don't even, doesn't even consider themselves as a so-called creative person. Yeah. Would you have any thoughts on that? I would have loads of thoughts on that. <laughs> Good. I, I, and, well, actually, I, I very little say about it, except if you have ever had an inclination or uh, a goo on you or, uh, what would I be able to do that? Just go and do it. Just go and do it. It's amazing. It, 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 it is beyond amazing how it will change your life. And just trust yourself and just 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 go and do it. I mean, I, as I said uh, earlier, I was 68 when I released my first album. And wow, amazing. I love it. And it's, it, it, I have never been healthier and I have never been happier. With all due respect to my family, I love them all dearly. But I, in... in as for me, I have never been happier. I'm much lighter in myself. I'm, I'm just, just happy, very happy, a very happy person, and and that's because of my music and my creativity and writing and uh, just open up your heart and open up your mind and you never know what will happen. You'd never know what will happen. Well said, Anne. Well, listen, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, and long may you prosper and create. And uh, thanks for for your time and kind words and, and great stories and uh, look forward to, to seeing you playing some music before Absolutely. long. Likewise. And lots of love to you and Susie. Thanks a million, Rory. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. Thank you. 
Hello, Ruri here again. A huge thanks to Anne for that great conversation and to you for listening. Please help others find this episode by sending them a link, by mentioning it on social media, by subscribing to the podcast and by leaving a rating and a review on your favorite podcast app. And if you do feel inclined, you can chip into the podcast as a patron or donor over at loveandcourage.org. It all matters. It's all appreciated. It helps get voices like Anne's out into the world. If you are new to the podcast, do check out the archive. Some wonderful conversations in there. Thanks again to all of you who are part of the Love and Courage community. I look forward to sharing more episodes with you soon. Thanks again.